Okay, everyone, can you see my slides all right? Yes, we can. All right, great. So I guess we can get started. So um, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, again, thanks so much for all of our organizers for NGS uh, sharing session to have a chance to talk with our, all of our prospective head damage uh, candidates. Uh, so yes, this is actually what PhD stands for. And um, I, I want to talk about a topic that's very dear to my heart because I do natural language processing. It's a subfield of AI and machine learning. And this is a very popular area these days with the, uh, the rise of neural networks. And um, previously I was an editor uh, of a very large uh, corpus of articles called the ACO Anthology, which uh, basically summarizes all of natural language processing research. And I saw a danger that research was going very fast and we actually need to slow down a little bit. So this is a talk based on that. Okay, yeah, you may know this gentleman, his name is Daniel Kahneman. Um, he is a very popular author in the psychology domain and he came up with, uh, well, consolidated a lot of theories about this idea of research, uh, sorry, system one and system two, uh, our, our fast system and our slow system. So they have various names, but he decided it would be easier not to give any connotation. So system one is a very uh, reptilian response. It comes from the core parts of our, our brainstem. It's very intuitive and parallel. And unfortunately, it's not able to reason. So this is a reflexive action. And you know, the humans have also evolved the second system called system two, which is much more deliberate. It's very controlled and analytical. So when we think about uh, deductive logic and all of these other types of things, then this is what we say. So Shalinder is very much right. He is the author of fast and slow, uh, thinking fast and slow. So this is where my talk comes from, is the idea that we can also do research fast and slow. Now, um, if you think about it for a second, which one of these systems is embodied by what we see currently in today's technology in deep learning and AI? So if you've been following any of the AI hype, you will know it's actually system one, okay? Now system one uh, uh, systems are uh, fast and automatic. So now these systems can do object recognition, they can translate languages, they can summarize, uh, they can do lots of things, retrieve information very, very quickly. And they can do that now at superhuman levels because of, as we all know, machines don't get tired, right? They can work all day, all night, even with the lights off. Uh, Many of our PhD students work with their lights off as well. Uh, but you know, this is popularized by Andrew Ang, who's the founder of Coursera and a, a Stanford professor. Okay, so I want you to think about, okay, I'm using the uh, terminology in machine learning here, but what is the loss function of research as a society when we come up with our old, own idea of, of what research is like, and we think about the entire society doing research or all of our PhD students doing research, how can we best optimize them? So in machine learning, there's this terminology of a loss function, which is helping us optimize the decision capabilities of let's say a classifier, right? So we want to say penalize judgments that are wrong so it can get better at uh, trying to produce correct judgments, okay? Now there's an, another author that you may have heard of, his name is Thomas Friedman. He wrote a very nice book, uh, which I would definitely recommend you read. And I, I'd say to all of you in the audience, you need to read more and don't read just within your discipline. This is a, a danger of tunnel vision, okay? So Thank You for Being Late was one of his very influential books. And basically he said in summary that the age of acceleration is upon us. We have many different things happening together that is compounding the way things are accelerating. So we have Moore's law, which uh, everyone in STEM knows, you know, the fact that computing power is uh, exponentially doubling, the fact that globalization, even with COVID-19, things are, 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 are very globalized. So many of you might be uh, coming in from another time zone. And the fact that you know, climate change and other things are accelerating the process. So he alludes to this idea of the second half of the chessboard, Whereas uh, you know things are just exponentially getting a larger and larger, so um, there are problems when we aren't looking out at the horizon and only looking at the short term. 
okay. And uh, when I was young, I used to play a lot of uh, RPGs, role-playing games, especially on the computer. Uh, there was a favorite of mine called Civilizations. You may have heard of it or your parents may have heard of it. And uh, one of the things there was that you can build technology. You can tell your scientists to invest more in technology. So one of the things that you could invest in this particular game called Masters of Orion was this galactic cybernet, which allows us to get near instantaneous galaxy-wide communication that doubles the amount of research points that a civilization comes out with, okay? And actually that is already happening. We have in our society, this galactic cybernet, it's called archive. So many of you may know this uh, uh, network. It's uh, basically a pre-printing system that allows you to publish things without actually publishing, right? You just put whatever information you want, you put it on archive, you tag it with some information and it's existing for other scholars to take note of. Okay, and uh, you know, when you think about publishing or perishing as the paradigm is for a PhD student, we think about getting citations, right? So citations are unfortunately over here, all right, in the terms of timeline. So this is the research time that you're publishing over here uh, on this part, right? Um, but then after publishing at a certain point, you may get citations months or even years after the citation is out, right? But we see now that's, uh, uh, you know, the idea of uh, research accumulation has happened so quickly. We see people even tweeting about their research even before it's published and news articles uh, ramping up to publicize or uh, politicize uh, research very quickly. So the research is getting very accelerated. The half-life, meaning the time that it takes research to go out of date is getting shorter and shorter. So my argument is maybe we're going a little too fast. We have our own age of accelerations as Thomas Friedman pointed out in terms of research fast going on here. So here in the screenshot, we actually see a bunch of uh, a scientist and a lab worker, okay? And the scientist is actually uh, this machine over here. That's the biologist, okay? Here's the biologist, okay? This person over here is just a lab assistant to uh, put in extra reagents into the machine so it can do its uh, micro uh, RNA analysis, all of these types of things uh, that it's carrying out controlled experimentation for, okay? So uh, we see that acceleration is really happening, this uh, compounding acceleration. In, in Singapore, we have this uh, word called kyasu, right? Which means that graduate students always have to make sure they're up to date, uh, up to the minute even, not up to the date, about what things are going on, okay? And this creates a lot of stress. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, uh, being in Singapore or, or thinking of coming to Singapore, uh, where the landscape is, is really built competitively. And that's not slowing down at all in research. Okay. Secondly, especially in computer science and engineering research, we have replicatable toolkits. So you can think about the PCA arrays or, or uh, GitHub, you know, these libraries or tools that make research exponentially uh, faster in certain domains. And finally, we have shared tasks. Uh, so even with things like COVID-19, there has been a lot of work to try to centralize all the data and then create competitions out of them so that researchers can uh, you know, earn their name in lights when they get first place in a competition about how to fold proteins or how to achieve better translation scores for uh, natural language processing. Okay, and uh, what we find is that many PhD students, when they're working on these competitive tasks, they feel like fulfilled because they're working towards something. They're going towards a goal. So working towards shared tasks makes people feel better. But perhaps when we do all of these fast research tasks, these are not actually what we want to actually aspire to. And I think this is where NGS really shines. The fact that we have an integrative PhD program that allows you to draw from the core curriculum across the entire university. It's very unlike our disciplinary specific programs. Now I'm from SOC, School of Computing. I think our uh, faculty is great, but I do see a very strong value in uh, going with the NGS option when that's available. Okay, so all of these types of accelerations make it very hard for us to do things uh, in a way that's more measured, more tempered and reasoning. So this type of overload of about having to pay attention to all these different things favors the convenience. 
Okay, so one of the problems with this is that when we take a look at what's going on in researchers' minds, it's also the case in reviewers' minds. So uh, just now we had a nice talk where we talked about the reviewing and uh, being able to publish in Nature, but it's also the case that our reviewers also have this problem. Okay, our reviewers favor the convenience. All right, they look at things that are state of the art, or maybe incremental advances where uh, uh, there's a shared task or something to defend. And, you know, incremental research gets published, okay? At the cost of perhaps longer term vision that needs to be really thought about more carefully. So I, I alluded to this point at the very beginning about the loss function of research. Okay, so if you can think about all of our scientists uh, being in a space where they're trying to make optimizations and publish their work, you can put them on this very large uh, graph and then think about which way they would go. So uh, in the idea of machine learning research, you try to optimize and find lower loss. So marbles that are placed in this uh, you know, manifold might try to find the lower points. Okay, so the problem is when we have these accelerations, pretty much all of the marbles or wherever you start in the plane is going to aggregate in these deep pockets. So it means that everyone is chasing the same goals to try to do very well on some specific uh, well-engineered problem without really seeing the horizon, knowing what's the really th the target of the research in the end, okay? So again, this favors the convenience of research rather than thinking about what is the higher order goals that we want. Okay, and this is again, why I think this is really important for NGS. So as a graduate student, when you start your research uh, and you're not published, you know, maybe you need to think about what to do, okay? Maybe you just give up or sigh and come, you know, take a nap or talk with your friends. Or maybe you say, well, you know, my experiments uh, don't have enough data. I need to collect more data. Maybe I need to retry the experiment because maybe the results are not uh, correct. Okay, or maybe I'm going to go back and be Kyasu, right? I'm going to go to archive or, you know, uh, PubMed Central, read more articles there, find a new data set, find a new technique that I can apply. Okay, but maybe what we really want to do is study the problem more carefully, step back a bit and think about what is the right questions to ask. Okay, let your data speak for itself. Okay, and for this uh, analogy is, you know, for uh, example, when Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, actually, it wasn't a, a specific moment. Actually, it wasn't a eureka at all. He had worked very hard using many different collaborators, talking to many different people in order to get the light bulb to work. In fact, it wasn't his idea. It was the, it was his work to integrate the processes and to make it work together as an infrastructure that made light bulbs somewhat ubiquitous. Many people had tried different filaments before and uh, they didn't work. So I'd advocate that you now thinking about embarking on a research career also take time to think about the slow process of research. The slow process of research goes through a many different parts of the life cycle of publishing, right? First, you have to think about the problem, uh, discover, read other information, sense make of it. Then hopefully you get to publish. And then after publishing, there's a lot more half-life after that, which is communicating that research and maintaining that research. So that uh, euphoria moment at the pinpoint of this curve is basically the middle point or the two thirds point, right? When you think about scholarly articles, it also has this effect. Like when you read scholarly documents, don't try to read them all in one fell swoop. Many times you want to go through different parts of the articles at different times. For example, looking at the method and evaluation is very helpful, especially when you're looking at uh, information to replicate a research, but perhaps the abstract and the introduction are more important when you're trying to figure out whether that research is relevant. So I'm advocating research slow, okay? We want to actually open up what's possible to think about, not what's immediately available to us. And as researchers, especially in NGS, who are interdisciplinary and give a lot of critical thought to the research process, we want to develop the slow hunch, okay? Meaning persistently being affected and being exposed to other pieces of information 
outside of your discipline, outside of your specific research area, will give you perspective, very important strategic expect, uh, uh, perspective to help you with your work. So we want to lower the curve to make it easier for us as uh, individuals in this landscape to move to different areas, to explore interdisciplinary things that will open up and pioneer completely new research fields that we never knew that we needed to exist. Things that we need to do to do this is to actually make things a little bit inconvenient, okay? So if you think about a nuclear reactor, for example, there are certain systems in there that could be automated, but people don't automate them because they want it to be inconvenient to change settings, okay? We, we, we don't want people to be rash and react too, too quickly to changes, all right? The same thing we need to do in our research is to think about how the data is going to be used to engineer a research problem. Once we have a problem statement, we then have the means to solve it because knowing the problem is more than halfway to solving it, okay? So we need to ask the right questions, but when we get questions that are already dictated by other people through their data sets, through their competitions, or through, through future work sections and papers, that is not good enough. So actually, that is about the end of my talk. We see that uh, research fast corresponds to things that technology is uh, creating very quickly. In fact, individual people like you as a PhD scholar or potential one can make a huge difference now compared to entire labs of people earlier. Okay, and now companies, governments and humanity is adaptable at a much, much slower rate. Okay, so we have already crossed this very important crux point right here, where technology, STEM, STEAM is evolving so fast that humans can't keep up. Okay, it's our duty as scholars, especially in an interdisciplinary program like NGS, to really think about what it means to do research right and slow. So we need to do research slow. I would argue we need to do it by using the time gifted by research fast. We've gotten much better at accelerating certain progress, but we don't have the perspective to think about what it means. So in conclusion, I think we need to do more of combining theory to practice. Many times in computer science, at the beginning, we don't know what works, okay? Then we find out that we can fix it, okay? We can do research fast, but we don't know why, okay? And later, we need to do research slow. We need to know why we're doing it and why does it work? This does not come easy. There is no garden path for that. We need to engineer it ourselves. So let's close the loop and let data speak for itself and inform our models. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mim, for a very thought-provoking talk. Uh, very good as the, the final talk of the morning session. Um, so the audience, please, um, you can ask your question through the Q&A by typing, or you can raise your hand. Um, so uh, I think we have one question. But before this question, I have one question I want to ask on behalf of the PhD students. So you advocate doing research slow. So, so as a PhD student, uh, are you saying that we should plan to publish at the final year of our PhD? <laughs> Not at all. What I'm advocating is that you do research fast and slow. Okay, uh, it's important because slow takes a long time, hence it's slow. Mm -hmm. You have to start with research slow first. Okay, mm -hmm. what I usually ask PhD students is, when you come into my lab, what do you want to graduate with? What is the topic that you're going to solve in four, five years time that is going to be so important that everyone around the globe needs you? If we don't think about these problems from day one, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. Okay, so in the meantime, while you're doing all this cogitation about what is the right research slow problem, by all means, do research fast. That's easy to do. But research slow takes time. It takes strategy. And most of all, it takes perspective, meaning that you must, you must go to all of those seminar talks that you think are going to be a big waste of time. Okay, we all think about 
the time, oh, we, we don't need to go to that talk because I need to publish this paper in two weeks, okay? That's not true, okay? We actually develop much better capabilities of research flow when we pay attention to the periphery, you know, our, our, our vision outside of our tunnel. Great. So there was a question kind of related. I think you, you kind of uh, answer it, but maybe, maybe I'll ask a question on behalf of the person uh, from Narali. Uh, ask, we often hear about asking the right questions, maybe for slow research, maybe for fast research, but most likely for slow research. How do you evaluate it? And if one is not asking the right question, how to move towards it or towards the right question? How do you know? Yeah, I think that takes a lot of patience and guidance. And, uh, you know, you work with more people to do this. Uh, I think uh, as a junior scholar, it's very difficult to know what is the proper direction. We get influenced almost right away by reading a set of papers as a junior scholar. Maybe this is relevant, maybe that is relevant. So I see this a lot of time in our junior scholars that after they read 20 articles or so, they are completely lost. They are very anxious about what to do because everything seems relevant. And I want to tell all of you as prospective head damage scholars, that is okay, okay? This is the problem of finding a problem statement. As I said in the talk, if you have a problem statement, you're already more than halfway there, okay? The problem is finding that problem statement it takes a lot of work. It takes patience on your part, patience on the part of your advisor and encouragement to seek out interesting corners, okay? So it takes some sensing. You can, you can think of a dog trying to find a trail. It does take time. The more you read, especially at the very high level, I don't mean reading a paper in depth. I mean, scanning papers and looking through maybe thousands of articles a week, you know, just by reading their abstracts, that is actually possible to do. And after doing this, you will feel lost, but you will also know the landscape around you much more, okay? As a good driver, you're supposed to know your defensive driving. You need to be aware of your surroundings, but many scholars don't. We have this tunnel vision where we see through a very narrow tube of our discipline. We need to stop that and encourage us look towards many different areas. To answer Nirali's question, there's no right answer, but I would say getting more perspective, talking with people outside your discipline, talking with people who apply your science, those are all very helpful things that we need to do. Thanks, thanks Min. Always good to talk about this. I think actually you, it relates to what Abik said before also um, about research is not just about beating other people's performance or solving problems that people have stated is actually uh, quite a bit a lot about creating space for other researchers to contribute to. So, so that I look beyond uh, what is current. Um, so uh, there was a hand raised, uh, Ansel. Uh, do you want to ask a question? If you want to ask a question, please unmute yourself. You can unmute yourself, Ansel. Okay, while well, we wait for him to figure out, <laughs> okay. Um, maybe maybe um, one, one question from me again. Um, so slow and fast. Um, I guess as a PhD student, you mentioned we should do both. That's a much too much to ask. Can we just do fast first? And then maybe when we become a professor or maybe when we get a tenure, then we do a slow research. I think that's also not the right thing to do because uh, we need to develop the capability and it needs to be practiced. Slow research is a muscle, okay? It needs to be exercised regularly for it to make value, all right? So uh, just like you can take sugars to get a shot in the arm and be fast, okay? Uh, ultimately, those things wear off. You might find out that uh, after you've graduated that people aren't really caring about what you're doing because you have invested time doing what everyone else is doing, right? So uh, we need to be able to differentiate. We need to be able to claim uh, and stake out an area as an important that we've identified that we contribute to. So uh, you need to do both, yeah. Uh, I think research slow is not as important for a junior student as research fast because of course we know this publish and perish paradigm is very important for uh, 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 you know, uh, 
marking or milestoning your uh, achievements, just like a CAP might be somewhat important to uh, getting into a PhD program. Okay, but it's not the end all, right? Even if you had terrible research publications, but you get very good uh, ratings uh, from your professor and your collaborators and say, this person knows how to think, you will still be able to land a job. Academia for better or worse is a very social enterprise. Okay, so we all know this, uh, letters of recommendation count for a lot. So uh, your research publications, as we all know, sometimes run into a stochastic process called a latent random variable of reviewers, right? Mm -hmm. So when things don't happen to go your way, people disagree with you, maybe, maybe you don't get published, okay? So all of us as professors have seen cases of students that we really liked that just didn't publish very well, and students who are pretty mediocre but got lots of papers accepted. So I think we've all encountered that. Yeah. So there was a question about how does one balance the pressure to deliver results and high expectations. I think let me answer quickly, but I, I will let Min. Uh, you should find a, a, a supervisor that uh, advocates low research. But anyway, um, Min Yen, you want to answer that? How do you balance the pressure? I think uh, you have to look at it as a strategic uh, game. So at the beginning, it's good to try to build confidence. So this is where research fast comes in, okay? It's good to try to uh, build build some portfolio that you can say, get, get some level of confidence in yourself. I really think that most people who do a PhD are qualified to get it. You know, it's, it's not a matter of that. It's a, a matter of um, emotional and mental well-being and confidence to know that you're doing the right thing. So this is where research flow really comes in very handy because if you know that you're doing the right thing, by thinking about the landscape of where your research lies, it's much easier to develop psychological resilience to failure, okay? When we do research fast, we are abetting psychological failure. Why? For example, when we do shared tasks, when there are a lot of people working on the same problem and it's very cutthroat to publish within X number of months, then it becomes very psychologically damaging. Science is not a rat race. It's for the progress of humanity. Okay, but unfortunately, publishing and the way the scientific network works to uh, cite people who are famous and the rich get richer, that is abetting this psychological damage that we see with research fast. So I would, uh, again, advise that you try to center yourself uh, and think about research flow as a first and uh, core part of your muscles in your brain to develop the tolerance to failure. Yeah. So I think um, maybe I'll wrap up the session. So as Prof. O has said in the beginning in EDUS, we focus on quality, not quantity. So this uh, reflects in what you all talk about. And of course, um, the journey of uh, uh, PhD is a long process. So you need to balance, it's not so simple. We don't have a straight answer, like all the research question you're looking for, but that's what the, what's the fun part about it, right? And, and I think um, as we do, if we focus too much on fast research, you forgot about what you started out for. So in Chinese, we always say, more wang chu xin. So, so you must always remember what you started out for. Remember, Minyan asked the very first question, what do you want to do uh, when you start your PhD? And as you go through the paper chase, the red race a little bit, don't forget. And that's when you want to do the slow research. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, please. Um, um, Take the time, we'll take a break for 30 minutes um, and go to the individual e-booth and all that and continue to, uh, you can always Google us and then email us questions. And then I hope to see uh, some of you um, uh, next year, uh, I don't know when, I mean, uh, 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 as a PhD student and start the journey with us. Thank you everybody, bye-bye. Thanks. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>